Our next speaker is the former associate president of the Minnesota Atheists and one of the hosts of their radio show, Atheist Talk. She writes at Almost Diamonds, and she's also the most amazing person I know in this, um, in this whole universe. She's amazing. Everyone, welcome to the stage, Stephanie Zvan. Thank you, everybody. And for all of the folks who work on Skepticon and did not get flowers just now, can we get one more round of applause? OK, we're having sound issues. We'll hang on just a second. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK, we'll try again. <laughs> we'll try again. It's OK, Lauren. You can sit for a bit. Is it better? We'll give it a try. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Stephanie Zvan. I am here to talk to you about the just world belief and what that means for activists, the kind of challenges it presents. And you have no idea what I'm talking about yet, and that is just fine. So as we know, or we should all know, because we all understand this by the age of about three, life is not fair. Don't believe me? Ask her. The problem with this is that's a really, really hard thing to internalize. And so we go about convincing ourselves that life maybe really is fair um, in an awful lot of ways. We certainly find this in our religious texts. So the Old Testament, I have to say, I really love this. They shall eat the fruit of their deeds. I'm not entirely sure what fruit we're talking about, but I really love that phrasing. Um, so we have, a, actually, this is just a tiny sample of the kinds of things in the Old Testament that tell you that life is fair, that when you do something bad or something good, the consequences that come to you are going to be bad or good in response to how you behave. It's certainly not only an Old Testament thing. We also find this in the New Testament. Um, you know, what you sow, so shall you reap. This comes out of the New Testament. We, we see this a lot. Now, one thing that's worth noting about this is that this idea, when we're seeing it in, no worries. OK. Hi, new microphone, steal me. Um, so the idea, when we're seeing it presented, particularly in Christian texts, is that what we sow in this life, we reap in the afterlife. Uh, I will come back to that, but that is very much how it is presented in both the New and Old Testaments. Um, however, we don't always stick with the idea that we have to wait until the afterlife in order to um, reap what we sow. This is uh, one of the many, many houses of um, some of our biggest prosperity gospel preachers here. And these are actually folks who have said on stage and to audiences, so when you donate to me, you're giving a loan to the Lord, and he's going to pay you right back. It'll be cool. Um, they actually mean money in this, um, but even outside the prosperity gospel, you certainly see this idea being presented that what you're doing, God's going to take care of you. He'll turn around. He'll give you right back. And the idea that, that what, we, what we sow, we shall reap in this world, has certainly reached beyond religious uh, intents as well. Um, if you go out there on Twitter and search for reap what you sow, you will find a whole bunch of people telling you that, yeah, no, it's really this world. Um, if you're having issues, if you're having not getting the um, kind of, 
again, prosperity usually, because we're really concrete. We think of paying back in terms of money. Um, if you're not getting the money that you, that you deserve for your labor, um, you just happen to be someone who lives in poverty for whatever reason, it's because you're not doing things right. Um, obviously, Christianity is not the only religion that has this kind of idea built into it. Um, this is a, a image that fascinates me because this is supposed to be Christ on the karmic wheel. I'm not entirely sure how that works. I don't think he dies, so we managed to get off of it. Um, but the karmic wheel is, is very much another interpretation of what you do in this life, you will get paid back in the next. It's a little less literal in some ways than Christianity, depending on, on the, um, the teachers that you follow, but it's still exactly that same idea. You do something, you get the same thing back. Do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. And of course, because we're really, really, really good at this, when you take this outside of the uh, religious context, um, we get very literal about this. Um, I will, for folks who can't actually see these, um, read these. There are a couple of e-cards at the top. First one is, so sorry to hear that the karma cake you baked yourself isn't tasting as good as you expected. Perhaps a nice glass of I told you so will help wash it down. And the other one says, karma's only a bitch if you are. And uh, finally, a little sign that says, welcome to the Karma Cafe. There are no menus. You will get served what you deserve. And even stepping entirely outside of religious notions, you can find this. This is just a quick Google image search for um, what goes around. And it will tell you what goes around comes around. Um, nice little image not at all crass, of the dog trying to pee on the hydrant and getting hit with the water instead. Um, one of them here says, I do believe in karma, and one day it will get to you. You will someday feel what I feel. You will someday experience what you did to me. It's not a very nice thought, but obviously some people find this a comforting thought. So back in the 1960s, there were a couple of researchers. Um, there was Melvin Lerner and uh, Constance Simmons, who did a study um, basically kind of exploring this idea, exploring people's ideas about justice. And what they found is that people wanted to believe that the world was just. Um, they set up a, a um, experiment where they had a scenario that they described where someone was um, subjected to something that was really pretty awful. Um, they found that people were fairly accepting of this scenario, as in they were willing to believe that it happened. Um, if those people were able to compensate the person who had been hurt, so they were able to bring something good to someone who had experienced something bad. However, for people, for research subjects who were not able to make things right for that person, they were not willing to fully believe that what had happened had happened or that somehow the person who, to whom it had happened had not deserved this. Um, Melvin Lerner went on a few years later uh, to write The Belief in a Just World, which is a book about this phenomenon. Um, he's expanded on it quite a bit. There's been, this was, as I said, the original study was back in the 60s. Um, the book came out about 1980, if I recall correctly. There's been quite a bit of research on this, and the finding is pretty robust. We all want to believe in a just world. We want to believe that what happens to us is a consequence of what we've done. We want to believe that those consequences are predictable. We want to believe that they're proportional. We want to believe that the world is fair. Now, Lerner described this as a fundamental delusion. That's his words, not mine. I'm not really fond of that use of the word delusion, but that's, I can talk about that later if anybody's really interested. So Lerner suggested that 
there are really good reasons that we want to um, believe that the world is fair. And I think he's correct in that. Um, certainly some additional research has backed up parts of that, although this is not the most researched part of just world belief. Um, he theorized that it was very important for the development of pro-social behavior, so behavior that helps us all get along with one another in a larger society, more than just one-on-one, -on -one, that we believe that when we do good, we get good back. Because if we don't believe that, we don't really have a good incentive to behave well. Um, so we got somebody, you know, I'm going to share my candy with you. Okay. I'm doing this because I believe that you're going to share, at some point, your candy with me. I'm going to get something back that is good out of this. You're not going to completely take advantage of me. Um, and if you talk to people about uh, particularly the sociology and anthropology of ethics, this idea that um, people are not going to, in at least significant numbers, cheat and take advantage of the bargain um, is very important to that. And you'll find that societies develop a number of strategies to deal with cheaters. Um, so it's one of those things that in order to get along together, we need at least some belief that the majority of the time, things are going to be fair. And we do a lot to teach this. Um, I'm going to show you a slide in just a second here with a question on it. Feel free to shout out the answer. What's the magic word? You know that's not, I'm sorry, what was the? <laughs> so we all know by now, I think, everybody in this room, that please is not actually a magic word. Um, but we teach people that if you ask please, if you put in the social work that we require for everybody to get along, you will get what you want. We teach people, in fact, that the world is fair even though we all know that it really isn't entirely fair. And this isn't something that just children do, or that just children believe, or even that we just teach children. Um, when we grow up, we don't grow out of our need for comfort. We don't grow out of our need for a blankie. We don't grow out of our need for believing things that perhaps aren't entirely true. And the just world belief is a really big part of what we don't grow out of. And when I say it's not true, it's really not true. And it's really not hard to find evidence that the world is not just. Um, I grabbed these back in 2012 when I originally put together this presentation. Um, Obama not being able to or not being willing to, not having the political clout or um, impetus to bring justice to all those folks who did their best to destroy our economy. Um, Malala, I think you're all probably familiar with her, who was promoting women's education, who was shot by the Taliban for her efforts. Um, we have children who are um, having genetic testing done, who get kicked out of schools, when it is discovered that they have um, disorders that are not even contagious. The world really isn't fair, at least not all the time. So it's really kind of hard to maintain this belief in a just world, even at the same time that we need it. And I will say, there are good indications that believing in a just world is good for us. Uh, a lot of the research that has been done has been done on whether or not believing in a just world is good for, for example, people who are victims of crime. And it turns out that it is. It turns out, and it's not going to be true for everybody because that's not how psychology works, but it turns out that for a lot of people, it's really important to believe that the world is fair because then they believe even if it makes them think that they did something wrong in the first place, it makes them think that if they do something different, they're not going to be victimized again. And it gives them a feeling of control, which is what they need after they've been victimized, even when that isn't entirely correct. So I won't tell you that it's rational, but I will tell you that sometimes it's useful. 
On the other hand, we're here, many of us, as activists. We want to actually make the world a better place. We want to make it more fair. And that is where the just world belief is a real problem for us. Because people want to believe it. They want to believe it now. And they go through an awful lot to protect their belief that the world is fair. One of the things that people do in order to protect their belief in a just world is they deny that there are problems or they avoid problems. When we're activists, that's obviously an issue for us. If people are avoiding the issues that we're trying to get people to act on, they can't act. They can't make the world a fairer place when they're hiding from the fact that it isn't. Victim blaming is a huge way that people go about trying to maintain their belief that the world is fair. I'm going to call it pretending because it's an easier thing to say, um, but that's not really what people are doing. Um, for the most part, when people are engaging in strategies that protect their beliefs and their biases, they're not pretending, they really think these things. Um, but one of the ways that we pretend the world is fair is that we blame the victims. We have an action, we have a consequence, they don't match up. So what we do in our heads is recast the original action that led to this consequence so that they match up better. Um, this is a poster that was put out in 2011 by the Pennsylvania Liquor, Board Control, Act, Liquor Control Board. Um, they were trying to get people to drink less. What they ended up telling people was, hey, if you drink too much, you might not be able to say no. And as a consequence of that, you might get raped. And the small text is actually even worse. It says when your friends drink, they can end up making bad decisions. Now obviously rape doesn't happen because somebody decides to get drunk. It happens because somebody decides to rape somebody. But we can't address that problem as long as we are blaming the person who got drunk. It's a real problem for activists. The other way that we go about recasting the original behavior as something that it's fair to get a negative consequence for is that we recast the person that it's happened to as a bad person. So this was a picture that back a few years ago was being passed around as being Trayvon Martin after he'd been shot. Now it wasn't Trayvon Martin. But people seem to think that if they showed a picture of a kid flipping off a camera, that that made it somehow less bad that he had been shot. You can find that now with people who are victims of police brutality. Um, Mike Brown, the uh, New York Times piece that called him no angel. Still doesn't mean he deserves to get shot, but it makes us in a very unhelpful way, feel a little bit better about the fact that he was. Then there's this one, but this by the way is a uh, headline from 2012. This has been going on for a while. Um, <laughs> oh, Trump. Um, this also happens with good consequences. We look at people who receive good things and we think good things about them because we want to believe that they deserve what they got. So Trump got rich. He must be a good guy, right? Right? Okay, fine. Maybe he's not a good guy. But that's still our first impulse. Um, and we see this with a lot of things. We see this with various award winners. We see this with people who, for example, get famous for being in movies. We really want to think they're good people or get famous for making good music. We really want to think they're good people, and we do a lot to protect our belief that they are. Um, this happens with Nobel Prize winners, too. We really, really overestimate the number of things that they're actually experts in because they won an award for being smart about one thing. So I was talking about the fact that we have an action and an outcome, and they don't match up. 
Sometimes we focus on the action or the person doing the action. Sometimes we focus on the outcome and we reinterpret it in a way that makes us feel better. A couple of friends of mine have a severely disabled daughter. She has a rare genetic disease. Um, she just became a teenager and her life expectancy at this point is measured in single digits of years. Um, they've known this since my friend was pregnant. And just after they got this information um, about their daughter, my friend's mother died. And they went to her funeral. And it was a really rough emotional time. And they were, at that point, sort of wishy-washy agnostic, not quite believers, but raised in the church. And that ended when somebody came up to my friend and said, God took your mother so that your daughter would have an angel to watch over her. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like reinterpreting the outcome is a good thing, um, but it isn't. Another way that we protect our beliefs is by coming up with reasons that these things couldn't happen to us. One of the major ways that we do this is by looking at people who do bad things and turning them into monsters. So it isn't average, everyday people who do bad things. It's only those few monsters out there. Um, I was talking about rape in the victim blaming section. One of the things that is really, really hard for activists who are working to decrease the number of rapes to do is get it through people's head that the person that someone is most likely to be raped by is not some stranger jumping out of the bushes in an alley, but people you actually know. Because we want to believe that if we stay within comfortable circumstances, if we stay within people, we th if we hang around with people we think are nice, we're not going to be exposed to this. So we turn people who do something bad to completely bad monsters because we don't know any of those, so we're fine. It's not gonna happen to us. The other way we do it is by saying, oh, that's just something that happens over there. That's something that happens in the hood. That's something that happens in the Middle East. That's something that happens to a different group of people who I'm not part of. My world is fair, even if that one isn't. Obviously, again, this means that we are not addressing problems within our own communities. We're not able to make the world more fair if we can't look that in the face, if we can't look at the fact that these things happen closer to home. Sometimes we believe that justice is delayed, going back to those religious um, scriptures that I put up at the beginning of this talk. Okay, so things might not be fair now, but they're gonna be fair after we die. And that's really, really convenient because it's really hard to check on. So far, nobody's coming back and telling us, oh, well, so we got there, but no, no, it still sucks. And sometimes we try really, really hard to give up on the idea that the world is fair. Um, Lerner and, and other people who have worked on this have called this false cynicism. Um, because it turns out we're not really very good at giving up on the belief that the world is fair. Because frankly, sometimes it is. Um, actions really do have consequences. Many of those consequences are really predictable. It's just that not all of them are. So it's really hard to lull ourselves into that. Now those, the, the strategies that I've just been talking about are all things that are classified as irrational protections for belief. Um, there are also ways of rationally protecting your belief in a just world. And those are basically done by making the world more just. So the first of these is pretty simple, punishment. You did something bad, something bad happens to you. That's fair, life's fair again, awesome. Obviously, it's not that easy. Um, if we're really interested in making a fair world, a fairer world, punishment is 
not necessarily the optimal strategy. It's a rational strategy, but that's different than optimal. Um, punishment inflicted by people who are involved. Um, let's just say they're not going to be your most objective people. If we put the power to punish in the hands of people who are removed from the situation, um, we are creating situations where power can be abused and more injustice can happen. Uh, if you didn't see Sakivu's talk on Friday night, Sakivu Hutchinson's talk, uh, including information about the school to prison pipeline, I definitely recommend hearing that. Um, be prepared to think about it for a long time. It's a really dense presentation, but very definitely recommended. Um, so by adopting punishment as our, our preferred strategy for making the world fair again, we open ourselves up to other kinds of injustice. We can compensate people when unfair things happen to them. Uh, and this is, this is actually a much better strategy. Um, as I mentioned, this was, one of the, this was the strategy employed in the original study that taught us about just world belief and, and verified that it happened. Um, so we can, make it, we can make things better for those people to whom bad things have happened. It doesn't erase the original, but you know, it's a little bit of balancing the scales. And finally, we can do our best to prevent things from happening. This, by the way, was a sign from the Reason Rally in 2012. It's one of my favorites. Uh, um, so, and this is what, as activists, we frequently try to do. Um, there are definitely activists who um, aim for compensation as well, and that's, that's a really cool thing. It's not the thing I'm best at. Um, I, as an activist, try to aim for prevention. And by doing this, we are faced, if we actually manage to make the world more just in the first place, we are faced with fewer times when we're consumed with cognitive dissonance and have to figure out how to um, either accept or explain away the fact that the world isn't fair. So in general, we have a whole bunch of irrational strategies for continuing to believe in a just world. As you've seen, a lot of those have bad consequences. A lot of those, in fact, in themselves, make the world less just. We have a few rational strategies. As usual, the rational strategies are far outnumbered by the irrational strategies. Because, you know, when you don't have to deal with reality, you can make up as many as you like. Um, but in general, we have a few rational strategies. As activists, we want to push those. So how do we do that? There are a few ways that we can do that by raising the cost of irrationality. So we, once we know how people are going to react in irrational ways to try to believe the world is fair, we can meet that head on. So if people are going to blame the victim, um, we can make that harder for them. We can defend the victim. We can raise the social cost in general of blaming victims. Um, a lot of this is going on right now, and it's really good to see. We can, and this is harder, not allow people to avoid what's going on. Um, as it, in itself, it has some drawbacks as a strategy, because frankly, everybody needs a little time off. And most of the strategies for continuing to get things, get bad things in front of people and not let them look away, um, if employed too much, are going to lead to burnout. And that's not good for making the world more just either. Um, but we have, we can do our best to, in more responsible ways, get things in front of people in ways that are harder to look away from. This is part of what, you know, doing the, Things like sharing articles on your Facebook wall do. People want to come there to socialize. They're still seeing these messages. We can focus on the here and now, and this is a big part of what we're doing here this weekend, is not let people say, okay, so these things are going to come in the afterlife. Because they can't deliver on that promise. I mean, it's possible that it could happen. It's possible that we could all end up in, in some heaven that actually works for most people, even though that's really hard to conceive of how it would. Um, but nobody can promise that and deliver it. And we can tell them that. And we can tell them we need to focus on the here and now if we want to make a more just world. 
when we're talking about um, people trying to distance themselves from victims. We can emphasize the commonalities between us and the people to whom bad things have happened. Um, this is very effective when you can say, well, no, see, I did the, exactly the same thing that this person does, only bad things didn't happen to me and they shouldn't happen to me and I don't like the fact that you're telling me that because I've done or been this same kind of person, that these things are okay. Um, again, there are issues sometimes with emphasizing commonalities because sometimes when we do that, we emphasize the idea that people have to be like us in order for justice to be a priority. Um, so it's something we have to keep an eye on. But again, it's a strategy that directly addresses somebody's avoidance strategy. We can keep perpetrators human. This is a hard one, but it really doesn't have too many drawbacks. Um, obviously, you can make somebody sound like a great guy or gal um, who has done something awful, and that's probably not a great thing. Look at my buddy Hitler over here. Um, but again, you know, don't, don't describe people as monsters. Don't tell people that somebody has to be evil in order to have done what they did. People screw things up. People can get hurt even when somebody is trying their best. Even when somebody is working really hard to be a good person, they can still screw something up. And then the last thing that we can do is show that other people care about what's going on. We can show that people aren't alone when they're sitting there dealing with the fact that the world isn't fair. And we can tell them that they're not alone in trying to change the world to be more fair, to be more just. Because all of this is much easier if we don't have to do it by ourselves. We can also lower the cost of rational strategies. When we're looking at helping people, when we're looking at trying to get people to help us make the world a more just place, we can offer specific solutions. So rather than getting out there and saying, oh, you're a terrible person if you don't care about X, Y, Z, you can say, okay, so here is what we need to do to make this not happen again. I need your help. Because that is a much easier thing to do than leaving them sitting there just looking at the fact that the world is not fair without anything to do. If we are going to talk about punishment, we want to keep a focus on it being proportional. We want to keep a focus on it being productive. Because these are things that in and of themselves actually contribute to justice. When we are compensating victims, we can expressly connect that compensation to their suffering. So instead of them just being somebody that good things should happen to, we can say, when XYZ happens, this is a cost to this person, we need to do these things in order to make their lives easier, in order to make it easier for them to cope, in order for them to not have to continue to, you know, we can pay for therapy. We can get them job help. So if they need occupational therapy, we can um, compensate them. And what we are compensating them for is all of the time that they had to take off of work. We can tie it specifically back to the bad things that happen to them because people are more likely to support it when that happens because it directly makes them think that this is more fair, this is more just, and this is what they want. And then, always, we can use the power of numbers because the problem isn't that people don't want the world to be fair, to be just, they do. And so if we can get people working in the same direction, we have an awful lot of people who want the world to be just. We just have to tell them how to get there. And then finally, we can raise the reward for taking rational behavior. If you're an activist, never waste somebody's actions. Don't offer solutions that don't solve anything. Don't urge people to slacktivist actions. 
make sure that when they do something, they have at least the possibility, because not all action is successful, of making that world more just. If we're going after, go after targets where you can succeed. So target people and institutions with the power to make things more just. Target people who can um, compensate for the way that they screwed up. Focus on companies. Focus on organizations that have the opportunity to um, make policy that will make the world more just going forward. And that have the power to get things enacted. Focus on your damn politicians. They have an awful lot of power. They should use it well. When you're asking people to make change, ask for specific changes. Don't let them feel a need to make a change and not have anything to do. Don't let them sit there and feel the pressure to make the world more just without being able to do it. Figure out what it means to succeed. Figure out what it means to make the world more just when you're calling for action. And then when you do succeed, celebrate. Celebrate the fuck out of that. <laughs> because good Lord, there's enough injustice in the world. Let's celebrate the times when we get to justice or when we make a step toward justice because we will all feel so much better about that and we will feel so much less pressure to deny in the first place that the fact that the fact that the world is unjust if we feel we can do something about it. Thank you, everybody.